started on these uh, lies? Yes, good. Okay. Uh, I've got my camera set up here on, uh, so I'm doing a bit of experimenting. So anyway, this particular fly, can you see it there? Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay, this is called the hands. And what I plan on hope to do this morning is give you guys a, a sample of three flies that are destination flies that I, I've used at Kluxui. And uh, after which, if you guys want to hang in there, I'm going to go over a list of uh, items for guys who've never been there before about oh, secrets there and some safety and some general information that could come in handy there. Anyway, <clears throat> this particular fly you see here is called the hands fly. And the story behind this is that up at Klexui, I've been going there for about 24 years now. There were two guys on the beach, really, really good fishermen. And uh, never knew what they were using. So you always watch their rods when they were walking or whatever and see what they had on their rods. And they had this on there. But people try to duplicate it. They'd never give it away. But uh, they could never beat these guys at catching fish on the beach. So about six years later, after I'd been going there, one of the guys, these two guys, his name was Hans, and that's what this is called, a Hans fly. Oh, hello? We lost uh, Dennis. Just a question: Are we recording this? What do you, what do you mean we're even? Yes. Oh, is. So anyway, Dennis, why we, we're even will be another subject. Here, here is Dennis, what I'm using. Dennis, we lost you for about the last thirty seconds. So can you repeat that, or whatever? Okay. Well, the secret yeah. was he showed me the secret. And I'm about to show you the secret of his fly right now. This is the hook I use. It's a Czech competition 300 curved hook. And I'll just, I'll just start. I don't expect you to follow me, but I'm just going to start tying it and, uh, I'll just give it a wrap. I'm a little intimidated this morning with all these professional tires and uh, rod builders and... Well, you got novice like me. Okay, so... Same here. Start with a wrap. And what I'm going to use for a tail is this... They call it ice dubbing. And I'm just going to take a bit of it. And crudely tie it in. So there's your tail. Sometimes I'll add a little flash to it. And that flash sometimes will be in a little form of a very narrow, very small spiral flash. And you've seen this done on other flies. We put one on one side and a little bit on the other. But I go well down the hook. And I guess what I'm looking for is a simulation of a, a shrimp of some kind. Now, uh, here's the, the secret for this fly. It's in the form of lead. And I'm using a 0.035 lead. And I'm going to wrap it right across the top. And this particular fly, why it's so successful is because of this lead wrapped across the top. 
I'm going to pinch the end of it so that when I tie it on, it's going to saddle over top of the hook. Hmm. Neat idea. Okay. And I'm just going to wrap crudely, fast, doesn't have to be neat. Dennis, right. does yeah. putting the lead on the top uh, make it ride um, hook point That's, up? That is the very point that it does ride up. Rather than if it was spiraling, if you were trolling it or casting yeah. it and retrieving, it uh, it gives it a, a rocking motion through the water. And towards the end, again, I'm going to crimp it so that when I tie it down, it's going to saddle over the top of the hook again. So there you see it, it enhances the natural curve of the hook. Uh, it looks pretty crude right now. So what I do is I'll take my flat pliers and I'm just going to straighten it out by crimping. Across the top, makes it really neat. The other thing he showed me was that he uses a lot of head cement to hold that. So I'm just going to soak the whole thing in head cement. Now, what I'm going to use, it's called Bright Edge. You can see that. It's a fluorescent pink, and it's made by Hairline Dubbin. And what I do with that is I take strips of it. Now this bright edge, and I don't know if you can see it, but the light goes into the flat se section and it brings it out to the edge. I hope you can see that. And it makes a really, really fluorescent bright edge on it. So I take, the, I take strips of it. And while that head cement is still on there, I'm going to wrap this on. But I start by taking a little a nick out of it to a point. And I'll just start tying that on in the back, the point, and then just work it. Back. Now this head cement is still pretty soft, fresh. I'm going to wind that up to the front. Quick, quick finish just to hold it there. Now, I learned this at the club from Dave. When you're wrapping this, do not wrap it too tight. You want enough of the edge to show. And when you wrap it, you overlap each wrap. But I tug it this way a little bit before my next wrap. Wrap it. Give it a tug, but not too tight. and overlapping each, each one. So if a fish is looking at this from the back side or the front side, he's going to see that edge. Dennis, is, uh, is the edge bright uh, 
uh, fairly elastic or is it a little uh, on the stiff side? It, it, does, it, it does stretch. And I used to tie it too tight. Consequently, the light would not really show through that much. If you want to make this fly even brighter, you can always add an, um, a tinsel underbody. <clears throat> true, true. But that's <clears throat> my basic fly. And <clears throat> uh, some people, some, uh, sometimes I'll add a beard to it, but in most cases, this is just a simple fly that uh, works. And I've been, the next day after he showed me how to tie this fly, we were on the beach and uh, we had a little competition. The pinks were very plentiful. Dennis, can I just we, interrupt you for a moment? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Ask, ask everybody to mute because I, we keep getting pictures of other people. Okay, um, folks, can you uh, mute your... Yeah. So, for strength, the hands would take more head cement and he would just soak the whole thing, head cement. And what that does, again, uh, besides strength, it also creates what might look like a, sh a shell on a shrimp. So if you do that and you're afraid that all the head cement is going to sink to the bottom, what I use to prevent that is I've got a little motor, a wheel on it, sponge wheel. And the motor comes from an old uh, barbecue. And that just spins my fly so that all the head cement doesn't go to one side. So I'll leave that on for about maybe 10 minutes or so. But because of the noise factor, I'll just kill it for now. Uh, fishing that fly, if the fish, the, they have locked jaw, they're just not biting. My son was fishing side by side of me one year and he was catching them, I wasn't. What he would do is he just cast it out there and just basically let it sit. And he'd retrieve it maybe one inch at a time. And uh, he would get in fish and I wasn't. Well, that's my hands. <clears throat> my next fly. And this is a fly I can use at the Souk River. Or Tluxui. But at Tluxui, this is the one I, I caught that big uh, I don't know, 17, 18 pounder on spring. It's called uh, what we call the weasel. And basically, what it is, I, I've taken and I've prepared ahead of time. I've taken all my crystal flash that I had collected over the years and I just made a big pile of it. And I'm going to use a, now you could use a circle hook, a number four, or just a number four stainless seal, 34007. that I've got here. But I use a cone head. I used to tie it with bead eyes, but they would collect a lot of seaweed and stuff. So I'm, I'm going with a tungsten cone head, medium gold.
And like so. What uh, I do for weight, other than the uh, cone head itself, is I use a little bit of this lead weight. And just make enough wraps to hide it behind the cone head. Maybe about three or four wraps. and tuck it in. When I tie it in, I just tie enough to hold it in there. Then I'll go back and collect my Here, click my pile of crystal flash, and I'm just going to trim it off so it's all flat and even. Bring my fly line back a bit. And hopefully, I'll put it in just a bit beyond the cone head. And I'll just start wrapping back. <coughs> and then I'm going to work my wraps forward to force all those fibers into the, the head. Now, what I like to do here is form a cone of thread behind the, the tungsten cone to taper it the same way. In the opposite direction. Faster if I had thicker thread, I guess. But uh, come on. So when I get to a point where it's almost a mirror reflection. Tie it off. Now, sometimes if I feel like it, I'll uh, actually put some tinsel or something on the shaft, though it's not really necessary. The next thing I do is I just force the fibers back and cut it to length. But for now, now you've got an option of how to finish this head off. I, uh, you can use a regular clear head cement but I happen to have some hard head black head cement. And using that, I'll take the time to make 
oh, maybe three coatings of this. I'll let it dry and put more coatings e each time. And each time it dries, it becomes a little more shiny. So this being the first coat, you won't notice it so much. But after about three coats of this, it becomes very shiny. And what that uh, what I think that does is that then I'll cut it back, oh, three and a half, four inches. Dennis, do you ever notice you get short strikes on it? Short? The long no. No. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you how, how I fish this one, is when the current's flowing, either in the river or at Klooksui in the tide change, the tide will be ripping across the, uh, the beach quite fast. And what, what I do is uh, I cast it upstream in the current and just let it drift. And I give it lots of slack. So there's a big, big bow in there. And I just let it float downstream. And uh, that's when I usually catch a strike. I don't jerk it, I don't retrieve it in any way. I just let it, let the current take it in a big strike uh, flow. <clears throat> and a lot of times, uh, last year, it was very successful on pinks. Uh, my youngest son and I were just killing them using these, these two flies and nobody else on the beach was catching fish. So <laughs> what happens is they see where I'm catching the fish so they work their way over right next to me. <clears throat> and what they're doing is they're really interfering with my, with my area, but uh, you know, I don't care that much, so I'll just move someplace else. But uh, very successful. And <clears throat> two years ago when the pinks weren't, didn't come in, the chum or the uh, the springs and the coho did come in, and that's when I caught that big spring on this particular one. When the schools worked their way in close enough uh, to the bait fish, I dropped this in the middle of the bait fish, and that's when I caught that big spring. So I'll put, and what ha what happens when that head becomes shiny? It what I think it does is that this is fluctuating to the water it reflects the colors also, not only in the cone head, but in the black finish. <clears throat> so that's, that's the weasel. And the third fly I'd like to show you is, uh, Darcy special. <clears throat> this one is uh, very simple to tie. You can tie it with or without the lead. But what I start with is a 34007 number four hook. But I bend it. And I start from the eye. And I'll just give it a little bend there. Work it towards the back. Bend it some more. So there you can see the bend I have. And the amount of bend I put in it is that the point is just pointing past the eye a little bit. The, uh, I use a fluorescent 
210 ultra pink thread. Wrap it to the back. And I'll actually go down the shaft a bit, quite a bit. Wrap it back. <clears throat> now I'm going to use a, a chenille. going to strip off a couple of strands there so it exposes the thread. And tie it in <clears throat> back. This is a very simple basic fly. And I'll just wrap to the front. Then what I'm going to use is this crystal flash. It's a green gold crypt. And I'm going to take enough that I'm going to start at the front and lay it over the back and then create the tail. So I'm just going to start with a tiny bit here. Yeah, much. What color of crystal flash? It's green and it's got some gold threads in it and it's crimped. Thanks. And I'm just going to Tie it in. <clears throat> I've got to tie it in at the head, but now I'm going to work my thread back. I'm going to spin my thread, give it some strength and color. And I'm just going to wind it across the top, holding it up and then it's coming down. But I want it to spread out a little bit across the back. right to the bottom and then give it a few turns. I'm going to work my way back again. To the head. And give it a whip finish. Then I'm going to cut the tail off, maybe a little bit longer than half the length. 
And that's basically the finish. However, what I do for strength is again, clear head cement. I'll do the head as usual. But then what I'll do is I'll take my head cement and run across the top. Right down to the tail. Well, that's it. <clears throat> that's called a Darcy. That's it. That's the Darcy. Mm. So, well, Dennis, what's the story on Darcy? Why is it called Darcy, and is it good for all types of salmon on the beach and this, the river? Uh, this particular one is excellent at Klexui, fishing off the beach. Uh, <clears throat> this is my go-to fly if nothing else is working at the particular time. Darcy, because my son Darcy designed it. <laughs> And uh, so that's my three flies I have now. I've got I got a few more that I do tie. That uh, Dennis, can I see the first one again? Yep. Uh, what do I do with it? What do I do with it? Okay. Yeah, this is called the hands. I don't know, can you see if I can find the camera again? All the hands. And you can see when it's dried, it has a sheen to it, like the shell of a shrimp. And it's tied on a barbless check hook. Can I ask a couple of questions here? Sure. Uh, one is the two of the flies you tie on on stainless hooks. What about the um, so the so the first question the hands? How do you how do you deal with those with those hooks? They're just kind of a you fish the fly once and that's history. Then no, actually, uh, if you uh, dry them off before you put them back into your supply. They, they shouldn't rust uh, or have any problems. Mm, okay. What I did find though is over the years uh, is that if, you, if you're fishing in salt water and you're mixing your stainless steel and your regular flies hooks, <laughs> the stainless steel salt on the stainless steel will cor corrupt your regular hooks and they will rust over a period of time. So when I'm fishing, and, and I get tired of a fly, I never put a fly back into my fly box. I have a little pouch in my vest and I'll just drop it in there. And at the end of the day, I'll clean out that little pocket, dry them, sort them, throw them away or retie or whatever with them. But I never put them back in my fly box because they do cause rust in other, other flies. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a total novice question that I was asking. So. And, and the other question is, I noticed you use a bodkin to, um, to put on the head cement. Uh, um, yeah. what's, what's your trick for keeping it clean? I'm just, I'm just curious. On the side here, right down here, I have a piece of paper and I just wipe it. Oh, you just wipe it, okay. Every time I put it back into a styrofoam holder. Okay, and thank if, you. If, if the glue gets stuck on your bodkin, get some really fine steel wool and just go with the steel wool in, in the steel wool with the bodkin and it cleans it all off. <laughs> or I can use emery cloth. Yeah, that too. So that's the three flies. What I like to do now, if you guys have the time or if you want to stay tuned, is for the first time visitors to uh, click Zooey, there's, a, there's some secrets I learned some of them the hard way, but I'll just, I'm just going to rattle through them. Just be before we go there, Dennis, yeah. we, we usually do a little uh, quickie thing on tools and materials. Uh, okay. 
things because it, it uh, we've had some novice guys and we've had some questions. Uh, so the question this week was from Brian. He, he wanted to know where to get the dubbing block that uh, Florin has used to make drum, dubbing brushes. And I did a little looking around and apparently this product was originally made by a guy in Czechoslovakia. And uh, a, a year or so ago, apparently he still made them, but he's changed them now. He doesn't make the wooden one anymore. He makes one out of metal. So, and I think I, you, you can go get them. I right, just, just look up uh, dubbings twisters and you'll be able to find it. Uh, it's an outfit in Czechoslovakia. This is for uh, your uh, bodkin? No, no, this is for making dubbing brushes. Oh, dubbing brushes. Okay. So the, the question, the, the, the item for this week was, was dubbing tools. <laughs> and, and what dubbing tools do we use if we're not going to have a block to make? Oh, right. right. So, so this, this flyer I mentioned last week, this is a, a pattern called a sparrow. And it, it flows out of doing a, a carry special because it's similar to the carry special in, in some ways but it's got a it's got a dubbed body that's a mix of rabbit fur and uh and and squirrel so i'm gonna i'm gonna be tying this one uh on uh the 15th or whatever it is it's the hague brown i'm gonna tie this one for the hague brown guys on uh, wednesday night uh in two weeks but the difference between the carry is it's got this little fuzz at the top, which remember when we were doing the carry, I talked about the after shaft feather. Sometimes when you take pheasant rump feathers off the hide, there's a little fluffy feather in behind it. And uh, that's used as a head on the front of the fly. And that's also a very effective lake fly. Um, as far as dubbing tools are concerned to put this dubbing body on, I used a dubbing loop. Um, and, and so there's the kind of three ways you can get a dubbing brush that you can build separately, or you can just twist the dubbing onto the thread when it's attached to your fly. And twisting it onto the thread, the thing to do is when you're twisting it and pressing it on the thread is to make sure you twist it on clockwise, because every time you wrap the thread over the hook, it twists the thread counterclockwise. Uh, sorry, clockwise. And so that, that tends to, to loosen the thread every time you wrap forward. So doing that little clockwise twist, or sorry, counterclockwise twist. Yeah, clockwise twist. Uh, clockwise twist, making sure that it doesn't unwind as you wrap the, the dubbing forward. So I, I never dub it the other way. I never dub it counterclockwise on the thread. I always dub it clockwise. And every once in a while as you wrap forward, you have to give it another little twist just to keep that tension. Most of the time with dubbing loops, uh, they're pretty straightforward. You just make a loop with thread and you have some device at the bottom of the loop that holds the thread loop open. And then you insert the dubbing material into the loop. And there's a whole raft of those kinds of tools available. Uh, the most simple one is, a, is a, basically a hook that hooks into the loop at the bottom of the thread and it's got a handle on it or something that allows you to spin it. Uh, the next most common one is, is this guy here, which is like a, a little M shape. And you put one side of the loop in one side and the other side of the loop in the other side. And then you, you spin it to tighten the loop up. Uh, and of course, the third type is one that's got little spring wings on it that you hook one side of the thread on one side, one on the other, and, and that holds the loop apart. Um, you can, to spin, uh, you basically twist the handle of the thing, but you can buy ones like this that come with a, a weight and a bearing so that you, when you, you just use your thumb to spin it and it spins like crazy and that tightens things up. Uh, this is one that just has little springy loops. You can buy a cheapy one that has an array of tools that, that screw into, into the spinning metal part. So you can choose which one of those you want. Um, 
And then there's one which just is a, a little brass weight. And I know they sell one similar to this at Robinson's. That's lots of brass weight with the little springy arms on it. And then you just hang it and you spin the daylights out of it with your fingers and it right tightens up the loop. And then the expensive one is that Marc Pettijan makes, which again is two little springs, but he's got a spring on here that you can loosen and tighten the loop by sliding the spring up and down. And then you hold on to the, this, this collar and spin the whole thing like that with the other hand. So that's dubbing loops um, and, and other ways of getting dubbing onto your, onto your fly. We'll do a fly sometime here in the next little bit where we'll make dub bodies and we'll run through Should, those again. If I could add one, one little thing to this, a sure. basic rotary hackle plier um, is also uh, yep. quite useful for for making this, this would be the simplest thing to to use that's in some situation. That's the one, the the Griffin. That's or or similar. Yeah, that's and, and that's a wonderful that, tool. Yeah, and you, you literally take the fixed end of it and you just twist the daylights out of it, and it will it will spin. Exactly. Loop. You 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 hook your thread into it. You close the loop, and then you either put dubbing in it or you use it for uh, reinforcing peacock curl in a dubbing loop. That's, a, that's and, another way and, of using it. And then, then if you're using a, a stranded thread, like, uh, like some, of the, some of the stuff that we use, not everybody has twisted thread. Some of it's, it's a stranded thread. Um, you can actually stick your dubbing needle into the thread and split the strands and stick your dubbing material in the strands and then let it go and then spin your bobbin. <laughs> I can't ever seem to get my dubbing needle to go into the strands of the thread, probably to do that. But anyway, that's that was our session on dubbing tools. If uh, other tires have uh, nor vices, uh, yep. nor vice, you just put your bobbin in the bobbin holder and start spinning uh, your rotary uh, vice and just run the dubbing along. It, it, it's like a spinning wheel with wool, you know, that, yeah. that uh, and it just instantly, you've got uh, uh, a kind of dubbing um, mm. uh, wire or a dubbing, um, it, it's just a dramatic, it's it just. Uh, the other thing, there's a recent, um, in the riffle is a YouTube, uh, site, and he was showing some uh, dubbing tools, and one that he sh showed, which is very simple, is one of those uh, which some people use uh, as a hackle plier. It's uh, one of those test hooks, you know, electrical test clip. Yeah, that's it there. Yeah, and and he put a nut over the top of it and glued it down uh, to the bottom there so, uh, for a weight and you can yeah. just spin that and you can buy those uh, test clips for peanuts on LA Express, you know uh dirt cheap. yeah like 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 three for a dollar 99 <laughs> yeah that's oh, no, cheaper the, that's, than that yeah that's that's the web page that's that's the uh now was that you put that up uh Florin, you're muted, Florin. Florin, you're muted. You're still muted, Florin. <laughs> I was trying to show dubbing blocks. Yeah, this is the replacement for the uh, for the dubbing block that the uh, Czech guy has come up with. Oh yeah, I was mute. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was trying to show you the new dubbing block. It's on the pricey side. Yeah, that would be about a hundred Canadian plus the shipping. Ooh, yeah, sixty yeah. euros. Seventy. It's 70. sixty-nine. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, 
Yeah, it looks like a nice tool and it can be mount, mounted in um, just like a regular vice. It looks like it has a three eighths of an inch uh, rod there. And I think there is that South African vice, the J vice, uh, there is a some kind of a dubbing thingy attachment. So these are some additional snazzy, snazzy tool options. That's a good looking vice, but it's mm, kind of pricey. Maybe one of these uh, weeks before Christmas, we'll do a, a session on, on dubbing and, uh, and, uh, and show how to the different kinds of dubbing available and what you can make for yourself and just dub some bodies to see what they look like. This, this is, a, like I say, a mixture of squirrel and, uh, and rabbit. And the, the squirrel came off of a, a squirrel skin. You can select where you're cutting it to get different colors. And the rabbit was just literally little, little bits of rabbit pelt. That's uh, mix up and you can throw some antron in there too to make it a little stickier. So maybe we'll talk about dubbing, dubbing one of these days. Just hey. everybody. Yeah. Uh, here's a suggestion in sometime in the future of spinning rabbit or deer hair. I ran into a guy who was doing some bass fishing. And uh, <laughs> you guys ever want to get into fishing for bass on the surface with the flies. This is, I've got a collection of these things that uh, I did years ago. It's even got a weed uh, rejector on there. So do you ever do any spinning of deer hair? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, what we, we did one way, way back, but uh, yeah, it, that's probably a good idea to have another whack of deer. I, I want to I watched in person, I watched Dave Whitlock tie a deer hair frog <laughs> with spots. <laughs> it was it was astounding. <laughs> Difference between spinning and stacking deer hair and how he put them on the hook. It was just amazing how he did that. So I can I can cover spinning deer hair and stacking deer hair and the various things you can do with it. That might be a, a session for fun. But a flying mouse with a wing, I've never seen that. That oh, is unique. That with, with the ears, that's... <laughs> it's not, it has ears and then it has the green wing. Yeah. I just yeah. found it somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> that's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's some, there's some nice little deer hair flies that, uh, that work pretty well. Small deer hair flies with clip body that uh, work quite well. Yeah, some people do do the atoms with the with the clips yep. with the clip body, for example. Yeah, I Don, found it daunting on small <laughs> sizes. Don, do you use clip deer hair flies from time to time? Sorry, were you speaking to me? Uh, Don Anderson. Oh. Don is muted. There we go. Not so much anymore. Uh, the yeah. reason for that is I do mostly lake fishing now. Yeah. And uh, as a friend of mine put it one day when he was looking at my fishing box, he said, there isn't any flies in there that hold, that contain chicken feathers. So most everything I tie now is tied to the synthetics. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the deer and stuff I used for years, years, like uh, humpies, uh, certainly... Uh, uh, some of the streamer patterns and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I used a lot of deer hair flies, but I don't do as much stream fishing anymore, and mostly because my knees gave out. Uh, yeah. But although I have a new bionic knee, and I can go back to walking on the creeks again. So I'll start back doing that again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as you say, if you can tie some big deer hair uh, flies for, for doing pike fishing, uh, they certainly make a disturbance on the water and it doesn't have to be too realistic for the pike to mistake it as a mouse. They, they make a very splashy strike <laughs> on deer air flies. Yeah. I used a uh, splinter mouse as it's called uh, on Fortress Lake uh, to catch some rookies on the surface. 
And it's actually uh, rabbit hair up four and that, well, up and down, both sides. It's a, uh, uh, anyway, and it's easy to cast, uh, easier to cast than a deer hair uh, mouse. And it was really effective. So Dennis, you can you can go ahead with your discussion. Good, thank you. Uh, as you can see, we had quite a few signups this year for Klaxui, and God willing, we'll all be able to make it there. So these are some of the three different categories I've had here: is secrets, safety, and just general hints. And it's more for newcomers is that under my secrets that I've learned here is that along the beach, sometimes the fish will show up at the same spot every day, same time. But that's not always the case. So if uh, you're walking down a beach and you see a guy, a bunch of guys sitting on a log waiting for the fish to come in, just don't sit down with them, but keep on going. Another one I learned was uh, smoke and mirrors. And this is referring to really foggy, foggy mornings. I, uh, I found one fly that was really effective for me in the, the heavy fog. And that's, this is what they call a, a BMW. It's got a big gold bead, shiny body, and a red towel, and a bit of a red beard. This was really, really effective. And when it's foggy. Uh, the other thing is that if you find yourself coming to your closing day of fishing and you still want to get another day fishing in but the wind is just howling, uh, I would go out there and wade out and the waves would just be beating me and getting soaked and trying to cast out into the wind. <clears throat> and one day I watched this guy catching fish after fish in the same conditions. And he was casting sideways along the beach in about two feet of water. And he was catching fish after fish after fish. So you don't have to cast into the wind. You can just cast sideways down the beach. Uh, the fish will be jumping a lot, usually, and you can spot them. But a lot of times, if you keep walking, and you'll just see them finning. And they're just almost not moving at all, just, just staying there in the school and fins. And uh, <clears throat> sometimes they'll uh, they'll take, but a lot of times you cast into them, you'll spook them, and they'll just explode and just take off. So uh, one method is just cast in the general direction that they're going, and just leave your fly sit there. On the other side of the Klutzway River is a big long beach. And very often the fish will be over there. You can see them, but you won't be able to get to them because the tide will be in. Well, these guys that were good fishermen would be over there catching them and you'd be stuck on the other side where there's no fish. And you're wanting to know how to get over there. And there was always rumors that there was a trail. So I tried searching out that trail <clears throat> and just ended up in the bush. But one year I was over there, at the very end, as far as you could see, there was a family walking out of the bush. And as it turned out, I asked them how they got there. As it turned out, you could drive out of camp to the logging road, drive down the logging road over the Klexoe Bridge. And there's a parking lot. There's an entrance to a parking lot down the dirt road. You can park your car there and there's a beautiful trail walking down to this uh, good fishing spot. And these guys kept it a secret for over 10 years before I found it. Uh, 
The Keel River usually produces fish when the Kluxu is not. It's a bigger species of pinks. But again, you're going to run into seals here too. If you're standing on a beach at Kluxui and looking down to the right, you'll see a gravel uh, barge filling up a gar a gravel from a pit. And they take that gravel down to California. <clears throat> but beyond there is a provincial park. And it's just a poster stamp type park on the beach. And that's often where you'll see a lot of salmon boats fishing. To get to that park, you have to leave the campsite, turn left towards Port McNeil, go over the uh, gravel conveyor belt, and about three or four telephone poles beyond that, you'll see a road leading down. You go off the road and it's a, it's a you cross the logging truck road, keep going, and it'll come to a uh, divide and you take the left divide and it'll lead you to a, a small parking lot. <clears throat> and then there's a trail going down to this little provincial park. Now, <clears throat> the great part of that is that there's a lot of coho and springs in there. So if you hit the time right, you can fly fish for them, but some guys take their surf casting rods with them as also, and they can actually cast as far as where the boats are really actually fishing. So that's a good little trip. It's not very long and it's uh, really close by. The other thing you should be aware of is that if there's a school of fish and you see some guys fishing in there, don't wade in because the further you wade in, the further the fish school moves out. And people are inclined to wade out to their hips or top of their chest waves just so they could reach them. But all they're doing is driving the fish further out from shore. <clears throat> Early in the morning, you can start right at the campsite and just walk along the beach and uh, looking for the fish close by. And if you see them, don't wait in, just cast from the shore. Uh, safety wise, as usual, you should be wearing glasses and a hat, but if you've got a pontoon boat or a float tube and you're fishing early in the morning and it's foggy, please don't lose sight of land because even though there's a foghorn going across the way, you can't, you can't see land and you'll end up being uh, drifted <clears throat> one way or the other. We had a fellow that uh, did that one year and uh, the only reason he found back to the shore was that he, he heard me and another fellow walking along the beach talking and he yelled to us and we called him in. When you're walking along the beach and there's a fly fisherman casting, uh, and you want to get by him and there's not enough room. Make sure that uh, he knows you're there. And what I'll do is usually I'll, I'll yell behind you and get his attention and know that you've got his attention. Uh, otherwise, uh, he's liable to get, uh, catch you with his back cast. And that's happened to me a couple of times. <clears throat> but while you got his attention and he sees you and acknowledges you're there, keep walking at the same pace past him. Don't try running past him to get to give, save him time because what he's doing is he's going to keep casting and, back, and he's judging in back of him where you're walking and he's casting based on what, where he thinks you are. Uh, at Kluxui, my recommendation would be 
print out a tide chart from Alert Bay. And try to re go out in the water at dead low tide and just check the lay of the land. And you'll see where it's really shallow, where you can cross the river, fish on the other side if you want for a couple of hours and give yourself enough time to come back without getting trapped over there. But the other thing is that every year the water, the land changes with the uh, flood tides and the floods from the river. And you can actually pick a way out to the front of the river and cast and catch fish. But the tide will come in behind you. And most times it's not a straight line back to the land. So you've got to memorize where that trail is back to solid land. Otherwise you're going to end up swimming. So judge where you are, judge the tide and keep an eye on the back uh, as to where the tide is filling in. Uh, <laughs> there's a joke people play on you up there, first timers, is that uh, if you're out fishing and there's three or four guys alongside you fishing and all of a sudden you see these guys leave and walk up on shore. The reason they're doing that is because a cruise ship just went by and they look at the point of land on the island on the other side and they time it for exactly 15 minutes. And when that 15 minutes is up, that wave is going to hit you. It's going to knock you head over tea kettle in the water. Ah. What are we doing? <laughs> uh, I've run into bears and wolves one on one, alone, isolated at the end of the spit in the dark. Uh, theft. Now, it's usually pretty safe up there, but I would never leave my rod and reel outside overnight. And uh, they do have freezers up there in the community washrooms and uh, storage areas. You're free to use, but don't expect your fish to be there when you come back. I know guys have lost a lot of their catch by, by that. Also, uh, there's been cases in broad daylight where kids will come around on bicycles and just pick up what's ever sitting on loose on the tables if you're not if you're not there or in your tent or something. So keep an eye on that. If you want to go for a walk along the logging roads, check the schedule of the logging trucks. And you have to verify this, but they usually don't run on Saturdays or Sundays. So if you're out for a walk along the logging road, watch out for the logging trucks. And I rec highly recommend you don't drive along the logging roads, mainly because the logging trucks are not the usual ones you see on the roads on highways. These are extra long, extra wide, extra heavy. And uh, these particular extra wide ones have an item on them that not many people are aware of is that in the back, they have about two or three feet of steel sticking out. What it's used for, I don't know, but uh, don't get caught by surprise by one of these big logging trucks. And if you're standing on the Cluxaweed Bridge along that road, just looking for fish or sightseeing, don't, don't stay on the bridge, hoping that a logging truck will get by you because you're either end up in the water or, or hurt. And just the general rule like glasses and hats I tend never to step backwards when I'm in waiting gear. That's when you usually trip and fall backwards. 
Uh, we do use walkie-talkies up there occasionally, just for keeping in touch with people. Uh, one year, I decided to stop off at the Adam and Eve River, fishing river. A lot of you guys have been there and fished it. This particular year I was there, uh, the fish were everywhere. You could walk on top of them, they were everywhere, but they were just not biting anything. Tried everything, tried every time I retrieved, they just weren't biting. So I thought I'd use the same trick I used at Klexui, and I, I walk out to the mouth of the river. And that's usually where I was thinking I would, I'd see some fish that were just fresh in and they would be, still be biting. So I'm walking out to the mouth of the river and there's nobody there, but there, I see fish there. So I start casting and before you know it, a hand grabs me on the shoulder and it's Hans, the same guy that taught me about this fly. And he dragged me backwards. He said, Dennis, you don't do that here. That sand gives way and you can be washed out to sea in no time. So that's why nobody was there fishing. So uh, if you're at the Adam and Eve, don't go to the mouth of the river because that sand can break away and you just be washed right out to sea. Medical emergencies, if you need medical assistance, there's two options you have and they're both in Port McNeil which is about 10 minute drive from uh, camp. And you drive down into the town of Port McNeil, you go past the gas station. And just as you're starting down the deep, steep road, there is a clinic there on the right hand side. This clinic is open most of the time. However, after hours and weekends or holidays, it's closed. Your next option is go to the emergency room at the hospital. And that's located, again, you turn down the road to Port McNeil, come to the gas station. But before you reach the gas station, there's a road to the right. And you go down that road and that'll lead you, oh, a couple of miles will lead you to the, uh, the hospital emergency ward there. And that's usually staffed all the time. Uh, and if you get to the emergency ward and, uh, or one or the other, and the doctor's not there, it's because they've got one doctor in town and he shares his time between the clinic and the hospital. But at the hospital, they're really good there. They've got nurses there and they can check you in or ask questions or whatever. Uh, that's basically it for my secrets and safety. Uh, these other things are just general hints. If you're going out fishing early in the morning, take some insect repellent because of no seams and mosquitoes are just terrible early in the first thing in the morning. So I'll, before I leave the camp, I'll spray my hat, my face with some uh, insect repellent. The other insect repellent that might be helpful is that uh, sometimes I'll use a laundry detergent uh, softener, one of those little cloths. I'll fold it and put it inside my hat band because these no seams are notorious for right around the brim of your hat where your perspiration is. That's where they usually bite. Another good idea is to get a buff, one of those all the head and the, so that'll protect you from the insects. But <clears throat> the other advantage of a buff is that when the wind picks up and uh, starts hitting you in the back of the neck, uh, a buff really comes up over your head, you put your hat on top of it and it, it keeps you warm. You can stay out for another hour. Yeah, there's one there. <clears throat> so a buff is really, really a necessary thing there. Also, there have been times when 
the fish will want to go up the river at the higher tides. They'll get up so far and realize it's not enough water and they'll come back down. And while they're going up and down, just trying to get up river to spawn, it's nice to have a small blue green fly, very small, right at the mouth of the river. You can fish the mouth of the river, uh, oh, I guess up 50 yards into the river. And on the other side of the river, you'll see a big triangular sign of wood. And that's the legal spot where you can't go any further and legally fish up river. Uh, if you see me out there fishing, I'm willing to share all of all my knowledge and flies, whatever. And if you see me move, it's because I'm following the fish or I'm judging where the fish are going. And uh, so you, you can follow me along that path if you want, or you can stay where the fish are and where they might be for a little bit while, while longer. But in my judgment, they'll only be there for a short period of time. So keep an eye on me and uh, we'll search them out. <clears throat> Dennis, do you do you fish a floating line? That's all I use. That's all anybody uses there is a floating line. Mm -hmm. And the lines we use are uh, the leaders. I use a ten foot leader, and normally I use a ten pound and ten pound tippet. But uh, recently I've gone to a, a fifteen pound tippet. Mm -hmm. So your your leader, your your main. I, I use a a real bonefish, ten foot, ten fifteen, ten foot fifteen pound tip, tip it. Oh, okay. So you buy you buy a tapered leader of that size. Yes, I do. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, the other thing is that they do have a sporting goods store in Fort McNeil. But it caters mostly to boat fishermen. There's very, they may have some fly fishing stuff there, but it's very limited. So number one, take your supplies with you. And the other thing too, is that one of my friends owns Ted's Tackle Shop and Supplies Fly Fishing Store. He comes up camping up there every year and he brings a lot of supplies with him that are for sale. So if you're, you need hooks or something, a good chance is that he'll have them. If you break a rod or something and you need a new rod, he does go into town occasionally, tell him and he'll bring one to you. How heavy um, of a rod do you normally use? I use a, uh, a six weight switch rod, 11 and a half foot. Okay. Oh, interesting. Uh, there is internet access up there, but you it well you have two choices. Number one, you could sit on the steps or in the parking lot right next to the main office and access theirs, and they'll give you the code to get into it. Or you can go into Perfect Neil or find out who does it, but they you can purchase a internet pass so that you could be at your campsite and use the internet there. And I forget, I, I'm not too sure how much it is, but you pay for it by the month or by the week or whatever. <clears throat> and they give you a code to access their internet. It's uh, about it. Uh, any other Oh, firewood, every campsite set up with uh, a fire pit and you can purchase firewood from the main office and they sell it by the piece or by the wheelbarrow full. There is a good restaurant there. Now, I don't know if they're gonna be in operation during the COVID, but 
it's it's really a good restaurant right attached to the main office. And <clears throat> on foggy nights, you're going to hear a foghorn all night long. So be prepared for that. Now, when you're driving into town in Port McNeil, which is 10 minutes away, the other choice is Port, uh, Port Hardy. I've been to Port Hardy once and I'm not very impressed with it. They've got a lot of car dealerships and a coffee shop, but that's about it. But in Port McNeil, <clears throat> you can get your gas at the gas station, of course, but the hill going down is very, very steep into Port McNeil and at the bottom of the hill, you'll see a parking lot and some stores on the right-hand side. Your grocery store will be in there. Your liquor store will be in there. <clears throat> and they've got a, uh, another shop there that uh, sells miscellaneous odds and ends. They do have a, uh, a big uh, foot-long sandwich shop there and maybe a little uh, cafeteria. But there is a good restaurant there also towards the water on the corner. I can't remember the name of it, but uh, they serve some good meals in there, breakfast, dinner, lunch, whatever. And right around the corner from that <clears throat> is a sporting goods store. Across the street from this main complex on the other side of the road, there is a sporting goods store, <clears throat> but they're, they're into tenting and hiking and camping and stuff like that. But you might want to check that out too. This internet store I was talking about, when I went to visit them, they were, as you go down the hill into Port McNeil, right down at the bottom is a dead end. And I think that their office was right down in there somewhere, right near the dock. Uh, about it. I, you know, I don't expect you to remember all this, but at least you know that it's there and uh, you can follow up on it. I don't expect to remember it either. That's why I'm taking written notes. I have a log book I've been keeping ever since I fished. Okay. And uh, as we're talking, and uh, I'll post them out on, after the meeting here sometime, probably today. Okay. And people so, can Dennis, can I ask you one more question? Sure. Um, you you mentioned pontoon boats and and stuff like that. Is it is it worth uh, bringing a rowboat out there, or this is Absolutely. much better fished? No, absolutely. Uh, I used to bring my my uh, my little uh, outboard and twelve footer out there, and, but the problem with that is that you had to either bring it in on your trailer every night, every time you're done with it, or drag it up the beach. Now a lot of people do drag their boats up the beach and just leave them at uh, above the tide. And nobody's having any theft or anything. Uh, they leave the motors and everything. I wouldn't leave my fishing gear in there, but uh, they seem to be safe there. But if you're alone, like I am a lot of times, dragging a boat up the beach isn't really all that great. So I do most of my fishing from shore, all my fishing from shore. But there have been times when the pinks will be schooling and they'll just be right, just a little bit out of reach of a cast from the shore. And the people with boats or pontoons or float tubes, kayaks, canoes, whatever, could reach them very easily. Now the boat launch at Klexui is very poor. Uh, most of it's is sand and gravel. I definitely think you need a, a four by four to recover your, unless it's really dead high tide. Oh wow, okay. A lot of guys do take their big boats up there and they fish uh, on the other side of the island or down the coast of it with their big salmon fishing boats. But for the most part, they do not launch their boats there. They go to Port McNeil and use the boat launch there. But they'll come back and bring their trailers and boats back to camp. Hmm. But that they've tried various things uh, at to improve the boat launch at uh, Koksui, but it's 
the tides and the way it just keep washing it away or uh, and it's just not not great no i'm asking i only have a relatively small rowboat it's it's 14 feet but it's a uh... yeah no that's more than adequate just as long as you can get get offshore uh 20 yards or so you know just out of casting range is where they seem to hang out a lot of times and the guys oh, will be catching them that. left and right they'll be catching them left and right out there in their boats just killing them. and you'll be on shore just trying to reach <laughs> you can't Okay, actually, I have a little dolly to to wheel to wheel the boat. It's it's a lightweight contraption anyway, so it's probably it sounds to me like it's doable without having to bother with the boat launch. Lauren, if you take your boat, take a crab trap. Yes, well, crabbing to no, be I, acquired. I, I, I don't have any of this gear. I have the boat, but I mean, it's I've like got, I've got lots of gear, and I used to take my crab traps up. When I, I took my boat, and the crabbing was good, really good. Okay, well, and you know, then, I then then I started thinking, well, I'm not taking my boat. How can I get my crab traps out? So I'd have my tide chart. I took my crab traps out at dead low tide, checked my tide chart for so I could get it the next low tide, and that's what I did for a couple of years. And I would get crabs. But having said that. There's a couple of things that have happened. The commercial crabbers have come in mm. and they've reintroduced the river otter, which used to be prevalent. It went extinct, but now they reintroduced it to the river. And these river otters are eating all the young crabs. Okay. And the crabs, there's a lot of grass, uh, eelgrass on the far side of the river, and they used to spawn in there. So two years now, I've taken my crab traps up and nothing. How long that's going to last, I, I don't know. And well, not this year. Oh. Ne next year, I'm hoping to be able to, uh, I mean, next year, meaning 2022. 20, yeah. Early in the morning when I'm out there fishing, I'll see these guys walking down the beach at low tide. And they'll be carrying what looks like a, a rubber tire. And then it would be a basket and they'll have a small net and I'll just walk along the shore at the mouth of the river and they would pick up a lot of Dungeness crabs that, that way, just by walking and picking them up. Mm. And there used to be quite a few of them doing that, but last couple of years, not so much. Mm -hmm. I asked one guy uh, I've known for quite a few years there and I uh, said, well, how is it going? He said, well, I got one or two, and that's pretty poor. I see. Thanks, Dennis. That's been really good. I hope you'll excuse me. I've got to uh, run on, but that was very useful, and I appreciate your presentation and your knowledge. Okay. Well, we'll see what happens when we get there. <laughs> Looking Thank forward you. to it. Thank Thanks, you, Dennis. Guys. I'll Thanks, see Dennis. You, uh... Okay. Thank you very much, Dennis. Thanks, Dennis. Do we have a plan for next week, Dave? Uh, not yet. <laughs> Give it some thought. <laughs> okay. Maybe we'll, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll talk dubbing. <laughs> we'll talk. We can talk dubbing. And do we do we continue with the Klaxui flies, or do I do something next week, or? Do you want to do that Christmas fly idea for two weeks from now, or yeah, we can we can do a Christmas fly in two weeks, I think of some type, and uh, I'll give some thought in the next day or so as to what we might do. I I, I think the idea of dubbing, showing different kinds of dubbing and how they look, kind of things. Yeah, I can demonstrate the mixing dubbing with the compressed air next week. Yeah, yeah, that'd be that'd be fun. And yeah. it works very well and no need for coffee grinders or any... I don't use a coffee grinder. I just chop it up with, with uh, scissors and then mix it with my hand. By hand, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, we, we, we can talk dubbing. Okay, so we can talk dubbing next week and then yep. we have to decide what else because we're not going to do a full hour just dubbing. Are we? Nope. <laughs> right. 
So is uh, anyone buying herring today? Nope. We bought our pickled herring last week. Okay. So no one else is going to the herring sale? No. I've still got some frozen in the freezer from last year to eat. Yeah. Okay. We 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 do this uh, Danish Christmas Eve thing uh, where we, we eat pickled fish. So but it comes in a jar. <laughs> Now, you know, the best deal I find here in Edmonton is these big jars at Costco. Yeah, it's not, like, the, not, it's not the Danish style herring, though. That's, that's more like roll mops. The, the Danish herring is quite different. It's quite, quite a bit sweeter. The Danish stuff is very sweet. I remember eating the, the herring stuff in Denmark and the, actually the Danes looking askance at me. Uh, <laughs> this was a... Yeah, I mean, I, I do like the pickled herring. So I was at the university. Uh, I was in Odense for you, Steve. Oh. You've been there. So yeah. I was vi visiting University of Southern Denmark in Odense, which is the, on the southern island of Finland. And uh, I, I like the stuff so much that I, I walked by the cafeteria to the office and I was having, because I was kind of running late and I didn't have breakfast.